is it true to say the, many of those elected in the first, to the first Dáil were either in prison or on the run? <laughs> well, Obukala is around. He's around for it. But Art O'Connor is actually in prison. He's, he's mm. been arrested in the German plot in um, 1918. This was another excuse for the, the British to lift people and jail them. Yeah. And around 50 or 60 leaders of Chevin and the Republican movement yeah. are arrested. So these are dangerous, and, James, these are dangerous times. It's not a case of like, oh, we, we, let's capitalise on the fact that the British kind of asleep after 1916. The British were very much present and very much picking up people, as you mentioned. Oh, yeah, they're picking them up all the time. Like, mm. And Art O'Connor is one, and he's in Dartmoor jail when he's elected. So he's not, act, he's not act, uh, the first sitting of the doll. Donald Abukula is. Mm. And it's only later on that he's released. He's in hospital at one stage then as well, because you have the flu epidemic, which, you know, brings us back to the present yeah. times. Yeah. You know, this is, this is a Spanish flu you're talking about. Yeah. This is the, yeah. the big Spanish flu then as well. And that comes, you know, interested enough, it comes in three waves. First wave is in June, 1980. And then the next wave is in October, November. And like we're sitting in the second wave now of yeah. the COVID yeah. uh, epidemic as well. So um, there was another a, wave then. Would it be a case back then because of the political activities and because life, you know, people died younger, times were harder, that the, the, the pandemic in, de- in them days was something that you just you know, just lived with? or it- Yeah, well, I mean, there's that many things that could kill you in those yeah. in that period anyway it's just it's just another one of these things that turns up but it has a huge effect and it's a devastating effect on the whole country Kildare is the highest um, apart from Dublin per head of population has the highest amount of deaths in the in the Spanish flu as, as you isn't, it, it. isn't it amazing that the Spanish flu I mean I'm sure you were aware of it but I was certainly not aware of it until Covid came along I mean not to the extent that I am now anyway yeah no we were we were very aware of it, and it was one of these things that we had covered then as well. And um, uh, one of our own historians, Ida Milne, has, has done a lot of work on the, the right. Spanish flu and that as well. So, so it is, we have 600 rebels in Kildare in a military base, which is basically the current, is, is, you know, Kildare is, I think the problem with Kildare is regard for, for, from a rebel's perspective is that it's proximity to the Curra and its closeness to Dublin Castle. They're caught between both places and there's 6,000 troops in Kildare. Is that right? Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, you have a, a very heavily militarized county. You have the Curra camp, which is um, at some stages in, during the war, they had nearly 10,000 troops there, but obviously not that many during the war so, of independence. So was it a case of the, of the headquarters saying, of the IRA saying, uh, and I'm right in saying the IRA, am I? It was a term, the IRA. Yeah, it was, it was, the, yeah, it was Irish volunteers up to a period, but from, say, 1919 onwards, they were known yeah. as the Irish Republican Army. So were the leaders saying, lads, stay away from Kildare, it's too populated with British troops, or was it a case like, let's attack Kildare, that's the place to be? Well, no, they're, they're just not that organised in County Kildare to um, be able to mount ambushes the county itself doesn't even um leave it as a as an area that you could mount ambushes because it's too flat too flat right it's, yeah and we were not that organized we didn't have that much weapons either and the fact that you know there's, there's a couple of ambushes that did take part or take place in in the war of independence you have retaliations then as well so you've all these things to think okay. about like the kill ambush in August 1920, the Black and Tans then run amok in, in Kill and Naas afterwards. Okay. And then the ambush in Barra House uh, near Atai in 1921. Again, there's retaliations in Minute. There's a, an ambush on an RIC man. He's killed there in March okay, 1921. So, so, it, kind of, so. It, kind of, it kind of dawned on them at that point then that like ambushes were out of the question. So what was their activity in Kildare then? Most activity in Kildare, what Kildare would be more famous for would be intelligence. And the idea was that um, to keep the roads open to the west and the south to headquarters in Dublin. And this is where Kildare excels. It's, it's in intelligence gathering. Yes. Because you have a, a fella in in Nace, Sean Kavanagh comes to Nace in 19, 19 or 1920 to teach. He's a Gaelic League uh, teacher. And he makes contact with an RIC man within the barracks, which which has this, which is a, this cipher um, intelligence key that he passes on to Michael Collins. So Collins knows kind of everything that's happening within the the RIC through the intelligence network in County Kildare. Wow. And then okay. 
It sounds like it, something from the Cold War, you know. It is, you know, it's it's really something that's it's being kind of overlooked. Of course, you know about Eamon Bry then or Ned Bry, who's who's a G man in in Dublin in the Dublin Metropolitan Police, and of right. course he's he's Collins's big contact, one of his big contacts. Um, you have Nelligan then in the castle as well, but Bry is is one that tips off Collins. On, and, he, on and a lot of the time, it's it's lads on bikes, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's it. Like, I mean, that that's the whole idea of the communications. Then, as we were talking about earlier, is that from Minute and that Colgan um, organizes all these couriers going back and forward from the you know couriers yeah. are coming up from the west, they're coming up from the south, and they're hitting Nace and they're hitting Minute on the direct lines into Dublin. So the, the lack the lack of a motorway back then was a big advantage for the rebels. Yeah, and you have you have a lot of girls and women involved in, in coming a man then as well passing on dispatches and that that was depicted and, well in the in the uh in the the wind of shakespeare barley with the ken loach movie i think there was a lot of women present cycling bikes sending on messages to, to the guys in the yeah place. there's a huge number of women involved and i'm very young women then as well and very young men i mean these these guys are all in their 20s yeah uh, in, in that period and that it's just after the first world war it's a kind of a period where military is you know, everybody's kind of involved in some military. And, and in a worldwide level, even the Russian thing was happening, there was a lot of yeah, you know, there's, people. There's, that... Yeah, there's all these things happening at the same time. And it's all young people that are involved in it. They're, you know, they're trying to change the world. They're trying to change the environment. And in. in your opinion, I mean, in, we all know that 1916, when the initial 1916 happened before, there, before the leaders were executed, there, were, there wasn't that much sympathy, certainly in Dublin. Um, whatever about the rest of the country, but how, certainly how... not in Kildare as well. Like there was, okay, there was yeah. very little sympathy to the Republican movement, and they do struggle, and they even struggled during that War of Independence. But that's, period. that's what I was going to ask you. Like, what, yeah. how, how much support did they have from the people in Kildare? Again, it's it's not it's not huge. Like, I mean, if you look at how many people were involved in the British military in mm. Kildare rather than in the Republican movement, it's far higher in in the British. Yes, I'm not They're saying just... that. The, the, and that's, that fed their kids and that, that that's it like I mean you have the barracks in Newbridge you have a barracks in Kildare Town you have a barracks in Nace and you have the Cora Camp and a lot of people uh, got employment through through the the crown forces and that and, I mean, and of course they're, they're going to assume they're going to assume that this is not going to be a successful rebellion either you know yeah well to be honest a lot of people are not thinking about a lot of people are trying to put food on the table yeah, and that yeah. that is the big thing you know more than anything else is how to survive in these trying times yeah at the best of times it is a big problem and again as we were saying you have the flu you have tuberculosis your consumption all these things like are a bit more important to most people than what's really happening around them Okay. Okay. So, as the as the War of Independence continued, then was there how did Kildare develop? Uh... Kildare, um, like most of the the quieter counties, is getting more organised as you come into nineteen twenty one. And nineteen twenty had been a pretty violent year, which kind of finishes off with you know Bloody Sunday and the burning of Cork and okay. Michael. And Ambush again, that's and all connected with that's, again that's connected with this intelligence thing, which is again Kildare, and there's connections there. Yeah, uh, and. Um, of course, um, with a Bloody Sunday, it's more the clear connections on Bloody Sunday, of course, is that the referee at the match is Mick Salmon. And his, and, uh, his grandson, my father told me, Mr. Salmon that used to teach me in clan school is a, either a grandson or a son. Fergus he, Salmon, that's right, yeah. yeah well, Fer, uh, Brian Salmon was his father and uh, the man who died, what was his name, the referee? Uh, Mick Salmon. Salmon, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a strong connection there, already. And then again, it, it's just in the Carberg connection with Frank Burkdead as well. He was he's a teacher at Saint Dennis. He takes over from Padraig Pierce after Pierce is executed, and he's playing for Dublin at the, the yes the time. And he was well. involved he's, in 1916 too. He was involved in 1916, and his sister was his sister was in a nurse in the GPO, and um, Frank was a volunteer. He's he's um, picked up after Bloody Sunday, and he ends up in the current Termin Camp, the Rat and Termin Camp, which is as a direct uh, consequence of the Bloody Sunday is so that opened. Was, that was called the, the Rat R A T H. Where did that R A T H? Because of the Gibbet Rat nearby. Okay. okay. You know where that massacre happened in 1798. Yes. Of yeah. The surrendering rebels. Isn't that so amazing? They, isn't that amazing to think that back in 1798 you had them that massacre and then you know 
was it a hundred and whatever years later, there it is another focal point, another serious headquarters there, you know, it's the yeah, Corra's history is amazing really. Yeah. And a lot of the people that are interned in the Corra camp are, you know, not saying that they're delighted to be there, but they're, you know, where they are, it's, they're overlooking this, the scene of this massacre of their fellow comrades from a yeah. hundred years yeah. previously, yeah. you know, so they're thinking about the martyrs that are, yeah. who died for Ireland. They're jailed within a couple of feet. Yeah. Away from this this site in, in the internment camp. And was so, there was was there was there was there torture taking place there in your opinion in the Korea? No, there wouldn't have been torture or anything like that. You yeah. know, that's um there would have been, you know, prison is is never nice no matter where it is. And um the conditions in the camp wouldn't have been great. But you know, it's generally it's not that bad either. I wouldn't mm. I wouldn't say that there was any ill treatment on a large scale. Okay, so that was open just after Bloody Sunday, is that right? That's Mar- that's open in March 1921 because they'd opened a, another internment camp in Ballykinler in County Down. That was quickly filled up and a lot of Kildare men were in prison there, about 60 or 70. And then there's uh, the internment camp and the Corps open then because the other one is full up and you have about 120 Kildare men. But, you know, and about the same from all the provinces or all the the counties around the Midland area as well. So Kildare then, you're, you know, you're housing a large internment camp then as well. But there's a lot of, um, when there's an escape there in September 1921, a lot of the people in the general area help the prisoners that escape. So there is a lot of um, support for... Uh, you think that that, 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 that kind that, of built, yeah, especially things, after Bloody Sunday, kind of built a little bit? Yeah, things are changing. Of course, the... The arrival of the Black and Tans and the auxiliaries yes. turn public opinion because these guys are just yeah. basically terrorist mercenaries yeah. going around the place doing what they want. Can you and just I go mean, into a little bit about the, their attacks? And you mentioned kill. Uh, is there anything else that the Black and Tans that comes to mind? Uh, big attacks that they took that took place in Kildare. Yeah, well, after the the kill ambush in August 1920, Black and Tans go into the village of Kill and the the wreck Brockles pub which is the old house in in the village of mm. kill uh steal all the drinks shoot the place up shoot a horse outside beat up a local man coming home from work and uh then head off into nace where they arrive in nace then and the, to start knocking on the doors of local republicans of course nobody answers the doors to black yeah. and tans yeah and um eventually they go across to a shop it's a boot shop beside a boot and leather merchant beside the Leinster leader offices and still there you can kind of see the mm. it's just at the end of the Leinster leader office right beside the what was then the RIC barracks but is now the court hotel yeah and they set that on fire and there's three people inside it who luckily escape right um the throw put petrol in the throw grenade in and place goes up in flames and of course they were lucky Ben Bushell and his two sisters were lucky to to escape out the back door, but you know these these guys didn't care about it, and then they shot up the town then as well, drove out the Newbridge Road and fired in indiscriminately, even fired in towards the military barracks as well as they were going by, just to show you know how how obnoxious they were really. Well, it, so, I mean, it's, it's 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 kind of it's stories like that, and it's not story; it's fact, you know. That yeah, of this this is home, what you know? I. Yeah, what I was told when I was when I was growing up, and you know, it always stuck with me. And when I was beginning to get involved in history, and that I decided to kind of look at these stories and then try and you know and, and see what's fact. You know, even when you mention individual family names, there it really brings it home. It makes it real, you know. Yeah, and and when uh, the place went up in flames, a couple of people people come out then to try and put the flames out, including the RIC men from the yeah. barracks next door. The, the ordinary RIC men, they're yeah. trying to put the flames out. A couple of ex-British soldiers are there. I mean, the, these guys, the these RIC out. men, they must have kind of resented these black and tan lads coming in and going mental and, and causing trouble. Yeah, they actually thought they were under attack. They didn't know that was yeah. their, yeah, own, right, yeah. you know, their own guys. Yeah. And you even have a couple of IRA men there are trying to put the fire out as yeah. well, you know, afterwards. So, yeah, I mean, you know, the initial question was like, would the sympathy increase to the to the cause um, in that period? And obviously, because of the Black and Tan's actions, it would have increased hugely. But um, coming on into the towards the treaty, then what was the kind of nationally? What was the kind of moment, or what what brought the British to the table? Well, 
The IRA is getting a bit more organized in, in um, the spring of 1921, where it forms itself into divisions and brigades and all that. And you have the formation of the 1st Eastern Division here on the, in uh, Leinster and that, which is where Calair and that are involved, Calair and Carlow, Mead and Wicklow, all these, Dublin, all these um, counties are.